Shirtless performance and pole dancing at a Christian event? What's going on? Let's talk about it. Ready. Aim. Shoot. Welcome to Arrows of Revival. God wants to use you as an arrow in his revival. And he's releasing arrows across the world for a world revival. Tune in as we discuss these arrows. Greetings. This is Bishop Reed here with another episode of Arrows of Revival. And today we're going to talk about uh, just the past week, there's been a controversy concerning uh, Pastor Driscoll uh, and what he said at a Christian event concerning uh, a, a, a man who was pole dancing or performing on a pole and uh, he took off his shirt. And there was some controversy that came up regarding that and whether or not uh, Pastor Driscoll should have addressed this publicly. Or, uh, so we're going to talk about this more. But just before I go any further into it, let me just remind everyone that uh, if you are the first time watching Iris of Revival, or perhaps you've been watching for a while, go ahead and subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you may know when we come out with other important videos and teachings. Also, I'm going to let you know that you got to get a copy of this book, No More Wacky Worship. That's No More Wacky Worship. A lot of the things going on in many churches today is not the type of worship God is calling us to. And God says there should be no more wacky worship, but he's calling for true worshipers, for a church that is sanctified, a church that is set apart, and worshiping him in spirit and in truth. Get your copy, No More Wacky Worship, to find out how you can ensure that you are worshiping God in the spirit and in truth, and that also the church that you are part of is also doing the same, worshiping God corporately in spirit and in truth. Get your copy, No More Wacky Worship. It's available on Amazon.com or wherever else books are sold online. All right. So let's get into this today. What I want to talk about today is public or private corrections, when to do it, plus shirtless performances in church or at a Christian event, should that be going on? And that has been one discussion over the past week, as I said, concerning Mark Driscoll. And if you've never heard about Mark Driscoll, he's the former pastor of the Mars Hill Church in Seattle, Washington, a large uh, evangelical church, a mega church there in Washington. And he was, the, he, I believe he was the founder and the pastor there for many years. And in recent time, uh, he had to, he resigned and he was first asked to step down because of some issues he had with the church, some wrongs that he had done uh, within the church. And then eventually he resigned. So just recently an issue came up with him where, as far as I know, he's been restored at this point, but he resigned from his church. But he was at a, a men's event in Missouri the Strong Men's Conference. And apparently, right before the conference, there was a performance where there was a man performing on a pole and uh, took his shirt off, climbed up the pole, and then uh, swallowed a sword. And this performance took place before the service began. And when Mark Driscoll went up as one of the guest speakers, he addressed the performance that took place. Uh, he said that it was of a Jezebel spirit, and essentially he was rebuking what was done. Well, while he was doing that, the pastor of the church uh, shouted out and asked him to come down from the stage, which he did. And then the pastor went on to say, well, uh, Mark Driscoll should not have addressed the congregation in that manner. He should have came to him privately first. And he cited Matthew chapter 18, which says that when there's an offense, go to your brother alone. And he cited Matthew 18 and said, well, Mark Driscoll should have come to him alone first before taking the matter before the congregation. So we're going to talk about this. I, 
I've heard uh, Dr. Michael Brown on the Line of Fire program discuss this matter. He also wrote an article about it. And he, he, he addressed a number of things, including whether this should have been addressed publicly or not by Mark Driscoll. And also he spoke about the performance that took place by that man uh, with taking his shirt off and going up and down the, the pole. Now, one thing Dr. Michael Brown said, which I thought it was interesting, he said that, well, that performance should never have taken place, uh, which I certainly agree with, of a performance where a man is taking off his shirt, climbing up a pole, and swallowing a sword, and at a Christian event, uh, certainly that shouldn't have taken place. But something interesting Dr. Michael Brown said, he said that, well, he doesn't believe anything seductive was taking place here in terms of the man being seduced by the performance uh, because he was citing the fact that uh, men often are around each other shirtless, like in locker rooms or in sporting events and such the like. However, I want to make a comment on that. Uh, in the time that we are living in right now, we got to take matters like this very seriously because we're living in a time where there's increasing gender confusion. We're living in a time where there's an a increase socially, there's an increase of uh, homosexual tendencies and same-sex tendencies. And the fact is that we do not know what temptation could have been taking place among the men as there's another man performing with his shirt taken off. We have no idea. And, and just as how we would not encourage, we would not encourage a man or a woman to uh, go shirtless uh, in front of each other, in front of opposite sex because of the temptation to lust. We certainly should not be encouraging the same uh, publicly among men, especially in a time where homosexuality, uh, same sex attractions are something that's being pushed in the world. We certainly should not condone these things. So we got to take this matter very seriously. W why is a Christian event allowing someone to perform an act where they are uh, climbing up and down a pole and they are uh, taking their shirt off uh, and at a man conference? And, and apparently the, 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 the guy that was uh, make, doing this performance is a former male stripper. Now, many reports have said that uh, the leaders of the church weren't aware of that. But despite that fact, this should not have taken place because it is so full of the flesh. It's such a worldly, uh, entertaining act to put on. Uh, and it, 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 it can cause nothing but to give place to the devil. Now, the Bible says this, and sometimes it seems like us as believers as a church have forgotten these things. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 22, it says to abstain from the very appearance of evil. Abstain from the very appearance of evil. If it appears evil, if it appears carnal, it appears fleshly, it appears worldly, we ought to be staying away from it. The church should not be giving place to pole dancing or something that looks like pole dancing uh, with a guy taking his shirt off and, and performing an act where he's putting a sword down his, his mouth. Why is the church allowing such a thing? It has the appearance of evil. The Bible also said in Romans chapter 13, verse 14, it says, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. We should not be given any place uh, to anything that could cause lust. Now, uh, they have said that the, the, the guy that was doing this performance uh, is now born again Christian, uh, and his life has been changed. And uh, if that's his testimony, then I, I can't take away his testimony. However, the, probably the leaders of the church should not allow uh, a person that was formerly a male stripper to be performing on a pole where he's taking off his shirt. And there is definitely an appearance of evil there. There's definitely giving place to the flesh. We got to be concerned for the brothers among us. 
uh, the brethren among us, the members among us that may have weaknesses that such a performance could give place to. The church should not be a place where an occasion, an opportunity to the flesh can be given. The Bible also tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, praise God. The Bible also tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, I should say, Ephesians 4 verse 27, it says, give no place to the devil. And in the church of God, we should not give any place to the devil at all. Now, Mark Driscoll, when he went up, he addressed the matter and he said that this performance was a uh, paraphrasing, was a manifestation of the Jezebel spirit. And definitely, I'll agree, there's something demonic uh, about such a performance taking place at a Christian event. Now, I don't know Mark Driscoll and I can't endorse him or, or not endorse him. I can't say much about him. I, I don't know him to that level. But I do know that this performance at a church event certainly have the appearance of evil, certainly is of a demonic nature, and should not have taken place. Uh, it should just should not have happened. The church is not a place of entertainment. The church is a place to worship God, to glorify God. The church is a place to win souls. The church is a place to minister to believers and equip believers to go forth and win souls around the world. That's what the church is for. And such a performance should never have taken place. Now, that being said, let me uh, talk about another aspect of this. The question of, should there have been a public correction or not? As I said, Mark Driscoll, he was a guest speaker and he did go up and he did address this performance and and uh, he, he rebuked the fact that it took place and the pastor was offended by him doing that. And the pastor said that uh, Mark Driscoll should have followed Matthew chapter 18, uh, where the Bible says, if your brother offend you, go to your brother alone and try to win your brother. And he, he cited that verse, the pastor of the church cited that verse and said, that's what Mark Driscoll should have done and that he was out of line. Now. As I said before, Dr. Michael Brown of Line of Fire did also address this and was point out the fact that it's proper protocol in church or any place that any organization where you're going to speak, it's proper protocol that you, if you're having a disagreement to speak privately to the leaders of the event uh, and, and after speaking privately, if the pastor was willing to repent, then the pastor could have repented. And uh, Mark Driscoll could have had the opportunity to speak his mind freely. But if the pastor chose to hold on to the matter, chose not to make a change, Mark Driscoll could have uh, uh, declined from speaking at the event and made a public uh, statement regarding his disagreement with what took place in his own forum. And uh, Dr. Michael Brown was pointing out the fact that that would have been proper protocol. Uh, to have happened. And, and frankly, yeah, that, that may be proper protocol, but in light of what took place, I really strongly believe it was more important for this matter to be rebuked than for proper protocol to be followed. And uh, the Bible says, Paul once said, uh, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. Sometimes there are more things more urgent, more expedient than the other. And in this case, this foul act that took place with this uh, performer dancing on a pole and uh, taking his shirt off, um, and, and then to find out he was a former male stripper, that performance, it was more expedient for it to be corrected than for proper protocol to be followed. I'm not saying not to follow proper protocol or that he could not, Mark Jisco could not have tried to follow proper protocol. That would have been good for him to do that. No problem. I'm just saying, I'm not going to spend time talking about the proper protocol he should have followed instead of the mess that took place at a, at a place where, where we should be worshiping God and, and hearing the word of God. That should not have taken place there. And it's more expedient for that to be corrected than for proper protocol to be followed as good as it is to follow proper protocol. Now, that being said, I want to address this matter. Is Matthew 18 
a right scripture to apply to a situation like this? When should there be public correction or when should there only be private correction? And I've noticed that people often get this confused. Uh, sometimes when something's addressed publicly, there's sometimes people feel like it should have been a private um, correction. And I've also seen cases where something that should have been private, people take it and address it publicly. So I want to do just a quick overview or a quick teaching on this. When should you correct publicly or privately? Uh, or another way I could put it, when should you apologize publicly or when should you apologize privately? Because I also see situations where people apolo apologize about something that could have just been left as a private matter and they apologize publicly about it. And sometimes people try to apologize privately for something that really deserves a public apology. So how us as Christian, how can we know when a public correction is necessary or versus a private one? So let me say, first of all, Matthew 18 has nothing to do with what took place in this situation with Mark Driscoll and the church because the sin or the offense that took place here with the, uh, um, the performance on the pole and the taking off the shirt at the event, the, that, that performance would have been an offense to the church, an offense or to the people in the church, and an offense before God. It's not a personal offense between Mark Driscoll and the pastor of that church. And since it's not a personal offense, Matthew 18 does not apply in that situation. So let's get into this. Praise God. When should there be a public correction? versus a private correction. Now, first of all, let me say this. Uh, avoid revealing private or confidential information. So you don't, what you don't want to do is that if a matter is private, you don't want to make that matter public. If you have a, a, a private situation between you and a brother, you and a sister uh, that is not known among the public, then that needs to be handled in a private way. You especially don't want to reveal private information, confidential information about your brothers or sisters in Christ and let it be known publicly when it's not a cause for the public. The Bible says in Proverbs 25, verse 9, listen to this, Proverbs 25, verse 9, debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself and discover not a secret to another. Verse 10 of Proverbs 25, lest he that heareth it put thee to shame and thy infamy turn not away. In other words, don't, don't become, don't be embarrassed or don't be put to shame publicly by taking a private matter, uh, a, a problem you had with a neighbor, a disagreement you had with a neighbor that was private, not for public debate. And you take that private thing, that secret thing, you let it be known out, uh, outwardly. It will ruin your reputation. You'll be known as a, a person who cannot handle confidential or private information. So you definitely should not take private matters and take it out into the public. Don't let the private faults of your neighbor be known publicly. For example, you have an issue with your spouse. That's not a matter that should be taken out publicly. You know the faults uh, of your spouse because of your closeness to your spouse. And no one else know those faults but you. That should not be taken out in public. You shouldn't be trying to correct your wife or your husband out in the public based on private issues that you are having, because that's a private matter. Those things should be corrected privately. Apologies can take place privately, uh, and those things need to be kept confidential. So once something is private, don't take it to the public. All right. And, you know, for many matters, begin privately or always start privately for any matter of personal offense. If someone offends you and it's between you and that brother, you and that sister, then keep it private. As the Bible says, rightly so in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, Jesus said, Moreover, if your brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone, alone. And if you'll hear thee, that was gain thy brother. So if someone offends you, 
uh, someone mistreated you, someone said something to you that was offensive, someone sinned against you in some way, then you handle it between you and that brother, you and that sister alone. You go to them, you take that matter to them, and perhaps you win your brother, or perhaps you resolve the situation, perhaps there's mutual apology, and the matter is settled and no one else needs to know. But then the Bible continues. If your brother do not hear you, here's what Jesus says. Jesus says in Matthew 15, 16, but if you'll not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So now, if your brother will not hear you, if you can't resolve that issue between you and your brother, then you, you take someone else in, uh, another trusted person in, two more trusted person in, let them hear the matter. Perhaps it can be resolved in the presence of two or three witnesses. Perhaps the matter can be resolved and settled, and then it stops there. Uh, the key here is you want to be able to correct that wrong and win your brother over, or you want to be able to resolve that situation without it becoming a public spectacle. Uh, so between you and your brother, it, 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 it could not be resolved. You take two or three witnesses, maybe it could be resolved there. But if not, then Jesus goes further. And he says in Matthew 18, 17, and if you shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. Now it becomes a matter for the entire church. When that, the, your, that brother refuses to uh, repent or refuses to hear you, or a situation where you both can't resolve that problem, maybe it's not sure who is wrong, but the matter is not being resolved. And then maybe uh, it may be taken to the, the entire church leadership or the, the entire board of the church or the church body. Uh, to help this matter to be settled. So you always begin privately with any personal offense before it's taken any further. So let's get into the public part. You can see right there, Jesus got into the part of where it becomes a public matter. It becomes a public matter when a brother refuses to repent when, uh, when after being corrected privately. If a, if a brother or sister in the church have, have offend, offended someone, they have sinned, uh, they have sinned against God, and, and as a result hurt someone or offended someone, and they refuse to receive correction from that brother or sister they have, they have offended, they refuse to hear the two or three witnesses, they refuse to hear the church, they continue in their sin, then it becomes a public matter that now can be addressed. The church can now address this uh, before the church. It can now be addressed publicly, right? So when a brother refused to repent and continue in their sin after being privately corrected uh, before two or three witnesses, and they're still not listening, still not hearing, then it becomes a matter that can be addressed publicly, all right? What else? Where else does it become a public matter? Whenever it's a public sin or a sin against the church, that continues. So if a sin takes place and it's toward the entire church, and that's in this situation we're talking about, that performance took place before the entire church. It's already a public matter. It's not a matter with this with, between two brothers. It's already public because the sin was done publicly before all. So in the matter of a public sin, it needs to be addressed publicly. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul corrected a gross sin in the church where it was reported that a man was sleeping with his father's wife. Uh, Paul corrected that sin. Why did he correct that sin? Well, he said, right in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 1, it is commonly reported among you. Meaning, this was a known unclean act. It was a known sinful act taking place in the church. The church, the Corinthian church, was known for having these immoral things taking place. And, and so because it was already publicly known, Paul addressed it publicly. He didn't keep it in private. He wrote it in the letter to the Corinthians, and those letters were usually read before the church. Paul didn't keep the matter private because it was already not private. The entire church knew about the issue already. And it may seem even some in the community may have known about the issue. So Paul corrected it publicly because it was already a public matter. 
also the Bible says in 1 Timothy 5, verse 19 and 20, where Paul is instructing Timothy on in, in, in how to deal with elders when they're accused of a wrong. He said in 1 Timothy 5, 19, against an elder received not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. In verse 20, it says, then them that sin, sorry, them that sin rebuke before all. Them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. In other words, what Paul is saying is, uh, do not accept any accusation against an elder, a leading minister, without it, without having two or three witnesses. In other words, there must be clear evidence from several people uh, knowing that this sin was done for it to be received. And once it is clear that that that, that elder is in sin and that elder continues to sin, then Paul said to Timothy to rebuke them before all. Why? Because it has now become a public matter. And as an elder, as a leader, that sin, that offense is against the church, it affects the whole church. So if it's a matter that affects the whole church, if it's a sin against the entire church, if it's a public sin, it needs to be corrected publicly. And one last example, once in, in Galatians chapter 2, Paul corrected Peter publicly before all. Why would Paul do that? Because Peter's offense was against the church and it was seen publicly. Uh, the Bible tells, tells us in Galatians 2 that Peter, he was fellowshipping and eating with the Gentile believers. When the Jewish believers arrived from Jerusalem, Peter pulled away from the Gentile believers. He pulled away from the Gentile believers to the point where other Jews that were fellowshipping with the Gentiles also pulled away. And so Paul realized he was not acting in the spirit of the gospel where Christ's blood was available for all to be saved and that all could come uh, to him by faith, no matter what race or background they were from. And as Paul recognized that, Paul rebuked Peter openly. Why? Because his sin was openly. And it affected the church. And in particularly, it could have really hurt the Gentile believers and make them feel like they weren't truly accepted in the church of the living God. So Paul rebuked it openly. So there are times where offenses and sins need to be addressed in a public matter. And in this case, in what happened with the, uh, the poll performance before this church event, this is definitely a public matter definitely one that would have to be addressed in a public way. But if, you're, if you have an issue between your brother and sister, go to them privately, deal with those issues privately. Praise God. I hope you're edified by the things that I've shared today. Primarily, what concerns me is the church allowing so much things to happen in the name of entertainment, in the name of uh, trying to get people to come in, in the name of uh, trying to get people to be comfortable or relaxed or entertained. Um, we don't need to do that. We need to depend on the power of God. Paul said that when he came among the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he didn't come in excellency of speech or wisdom, but he was in much fear and trembling, but he came in the power of the Spirit, in the demonstration of the Spirit. And we as a church got to get back to that place where it's about the power of God and not about trying to draw men in with fleshly, carnal, and worldly techniques that is not for us. Praise God. Let us seek God, that God will move upon us. Praise God to be sanctified before him and to allow nothing that has the appearance of evil, nothing that is fleshly, nothing that gives any opportunity to the devil to be in our church but let us allow the Holy Spirit to take control and move among us and that there'll be true repentance, that people, that God will by his Spirit draw men to come to him in true repentance in the church of the living God. God bless you. Praise God. Uh, I hope that this teaching was a blessing to you and that it gives you some clarification uh, regarding this issue that recently took place and also that it, it, it edified you in knowing when something needs to be addressed publicly or privately.
Glory to God. If you have been watching to this point and you have not subscribed to this channel as yet, go ahead and subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you may know when another uh, powerful video is about to come out for your equipment and edification to be an arrow for God's revival. Also, you got to get a copy of this book, No More Wacky Worship. That's No More Wacky Worship. It's available on Amazon.com and wherever else books are sold online. And again, this book will show you how to individually and as a church walk in the spirit of true worship to ensure that your, your worship practices is not tainted by the works of the devil or tainted by unscriptural or ungodly practices, but that it's in truth according to God's word. Again, get a copy of this book, No More Wacky Worship, available on Amazon.com and wherever else books are sold online. God bless you. Praise God. See you again next time on the next episode of Arrows of Revival. Thank you for listening to Arrows of Revival. To hear other episodes, go to RevivalArrows.com. Again, our website is RevivalArrows.com. To contact us, email hello at RevivalArrows.com. Send us an email to hello at RevivalArrows.com. And remember, let God shape you and polish you as an arrow for his revival.